at Caesarea Philippi before Jesus decisively set his face toward Jerusalem to go to be crucified, he had a wonderful conversation with his apostles. And in that conversation, he made an astounding promise to them. In response to an affirmation that had been made by the Apostle Peter about who he is, Jesus said this, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's a promise that he would always have a people in this world. He would always have his called out ones from the world. That's what church means. And that nothing in the world would be able to stop his building of that church. Now, it must have been a challenge at times for those early Christians over the first few hundred years of the history of the church to believe that promise. Think about some of the things that they experienced. Just a couple of years after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church in Jerusalem, was stoned to death by Jewish leaders and those who supported him. And it was all because he simply preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. His stoning led to increased persecution throughout that area such that many, perhaps most of the members of the church in Jerusalem had to leave the city. They were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, as Acts 1 through 4 tells us. And that kind of opposition and harassment continued on for three decades until in 64 AD, when Nero was the emperor of Rome, he began the first of several official efforts by the Roman Empire to stomp out Christianity. Nero wasn't content merely to arrest Christians or to kill them. He also abused them for his own pleasure and for sport. In his annals of the Roman Empire, the Roman historian Tacitus records what Nero did. He writes, Nero inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Well, it would stand to reason, wouldn't it, that some of those Christians in those days might have wondered about the veracity of Jesus' promise. Has this promise failed? Is this what the building of his church looks like? Opposition, persecution, martyrdom. It wasn't long after this that Nero ordered the decapitation of the Apostle Paul. Is this Christ building his church? If you'd been there and seen some of your loved ones tarred and tied to stakes and illuminated so that Nero could have light for his nighttime garden parties? Would you have remembered the promise of Jesus and said, yes, Jesus is building his church. Yet from the vantage point of 2,000 years of church history, we can look back and we can see, yes, indeed, Jesus was building his church. He did keep his promise, just as he said. He did it through Nero's persecution. He did it following that under the persecution of the emperor Domitian at the end of the first century. He did it in the beginning of the second century when Trajan executed another official round of persecution. And he did it through the seven other Roman emperors that officially persecuted the way of Jesus Christ and his followers into the early 4th century, all the way up to the point where Christianity was finally recognized as a viable religion not to be persecuted. And when we read church history now, looking back, we see how 
Jesus built His church through those times of opposition and persecution. He didn't just preserve it. He expanded it. And He actually used persecution to do so. This is evident in at least two ways. First, we see, looking back on history, that severe opposition to the development of the Christian church led to Christian apologists being developed. There were Christians that recognized they had to learn how to defend their faith. They had to explain their faith. They had to know what they believed and teach what they believed and teach why they believed it in the face of all kinds of accusations about false beliefs that they were charged with and false practices. And so in order to explain the faith, there had to be this more careful thinking about the faith. A second way that Jesus built his church through persecution is that he used persecution to actually spread his church throughout the empire and beyond the Roman Empire. Because when Christians were persecuted in one place and spread out, they took the gospel with them. At the close of the second century, Tertullian, who was one of those early Christian apologists from Africa, he wrote a treatise that was addressed to the Roman civil authorities demanding legal toleration for Christians. And in that treatise, he made this statement. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. Time after time in church history, we've seen the Lord do this. We've seen how he's used Christian persecution and martyrdom to advance the work of the gospel. Many of you will recognize the names of Jim Elliott, Roger Udarian, Ed McCulley, Pete Fleming, Nate Saint. They are the mid-20th century martyrs that gave their lives in order to advance the gospel in Ecuador. On January 6, 1956, they were murdered by the Alka or the Huarani Indians. They would befriended this tribe of people in Ecuador for the sole purpose of making the gospel known to them. They went to them. They befriended them. They gave them gifts so that they might get to know them and preach Christ to them. But on that bloody day, 65 years ago, some of the tribesmen of the Huarani attacked them with spears and machetes. And those men, all of whom were in their 20s and 30s, with guns on their hips, refused to defend themselves, but rather chose to die at the point of those spears and at the edges of those machetes. When the news of their massacre began to make it out and spread around the world, one of the recurring refrains that was heard in response was, what a waste. What a waste. Five missionaries cut down in the prime of their lives. It seemed purposeless. It seemed senseless. And yet within months, missions agencies were flooded with volunteer applications wanting to take their place. And there was an advance in missionary workers that had not been seen in that century. Within two years, two of the widows of those martyrs, Elizabeth Elliot, Rachel Saint, went and moved back to the Hurani tribe and lived among them and lived long enough to see most of that tribe become Christian. And many of them themselves become missionaries to other tribes. God's purpose to spread His word throughout the earth and His promise to build His church was served. It is not defeated by persecution and martyrdom. That's the way it always works. It's always been this way. It will always be this way. Opposition doesn't stop the church of Jesus Christ. Persecution will not cause His promise to fail. The chief cornerstone of our faith is a crucified Savior. Our God knows how to bring resurrection out of crucifixion. And Christ 
will indeed build His church. God will indeed keep all of His promises. His Word will indeed never fail. Now that's the point that the Apostle Paul is arguing in Romans 9, 10, and 11, which is the section of this letter that we came to at the last time that we met together on Sunday morning to study the book of Romans. As we work our way through these three chapters, we're going to see how Paul goes to great lengths to assure us that God's purposes never fail. What he says, he will infallibly do. Our plans and our purposes often fail, but none of his will. As we come to understand this and to recognize that His ways are not our ways, His thoughts are above our thoughts, and we learn to love Him and trust Him and find satisfaction and joy in Him and His purposes, we will be strengthened to live confidently, courageously in His world, knowing that He's not going to let His word fail. Now, there are many opinions about the place of Romans 9, 10, and 11 in the overall purpose of Paul's letter. Some think that these chapters are the climax of the letter because of this wonderful doxology at the end of chapter 11. Others see these chapters as perhaps a sermon that Paul preached that was added later to the letter that he originally wrote. And others would see this as something of like a footnote to things that he's previously written in the letter. Well, I've been helped to understand this section by recognizing it as a treatment by Paul to a remaining question that arises from the very thesis of the letter, which he announced in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Turn back there and look at those two verses, because this is where Paul lays out what he's about to elaborate in the rest of the letter. In Romans 1, 16, he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of salvation, power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, Paul spends eight chapters elaborating that thesis, explaining the glorious gospel of God's grace that saves everyone and anyone who trusts Jesus Christ as Lord. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus infallibly secures salvation for all who trust Him. That's true for Jews. It's true for Gentiles. And this salvation is so secure that as Paul puts it at the end of Romans 8, that there's not anything in all of creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, after explaining the wonderful dimensions of the gospel of God's grace, Paul takes up a final question that needs to be addressed. It's a question that comes straight out of this thesis in Romans 1.16. And it's a question that would have no doubt been on the minds of many of his readers and many of the Christians in the first century, both Jewish and Gentile. And we can frame the question like this. If the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greeks, then why are there so few Jews who have come to know God savingly through faith in Christ? As the message of the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire in the first century, many Gentiles, many Greeks, turned from their sin to trust Christ. But not too many Jews did. In fact, in this Roman church that Paul originally addresses this letter, the leadership at this time would have been comprised primarily, if not exclusively, of Gentile believers. So what about the Jews? Did God's word fail to save them? We see in verse 6 of chapter 9, that Paul very directly answers this question by saying, no, it is not as though God's word has failed. And he spends the rest of chapter 9 and chapters 10 and 11 defending that answer. And he does it primarily in two ways. First, he explains that the Israelites' failure to believe 
is not total. Their unbelief is not total. And then secondly, he teaches us that neither is their unbelief final. In other words, God has always and always will have a remnant of true believers among the Israelites. And on that last day of history, we will see a full number of those Jews, those Israelites, who have been converted to Jesus Christ. And this will all take place according to God's sovereign plan, according to the purpose that He predestined should take place from before creation. The 19th century Scottish Baptist pastor Robert Haldane summarizes this point in his introduction to Romans 9, 10, and 11. Let me read to you his words. He writes, Paul had discoursed largely on the justification and sanctification of believers. And now he proceeds to treat particularly the doctrine of predestination and to exhibit the sovereignty of God in his dealings both toward Jews and Gentiles. The way in which in the 9th, 10th, and 11th chapters he so particularly adverts or refers to the present state and future destination of the Jews in connection with what regards the Gentiles furnishes the most ample opportunity for the illustration of this highly important subject. So we're going to see predestination in these chapters. We're going to see the sovereignty of God. And Paul teaches these doctrines in order to reassure us that the Word of God doesn't fail. That God undertakes to accomplish everything that He promises. Well, with that, please take a copy of God's Word and open to Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. Our text this morning is verses 6 through 13 of Romans 9. But so that we might have something of the flow of Paul's thought, I want to begin again in verse 1 and read verses 1 through 5. But just note that when we get to verse 6, down through verse 13, those will be the verses under consideration this week, and God willing again next week. So hear the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of the wor- of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved. But Esau, I hated. The word of God did not fail Israel. Paul asserts this clearly in the first part of verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. He's just listed eight of the blessings that belonged to the ancient Israelites because God favored them and God had promised through Abraham to be God for them. And Paul lays down this thesis that with all that God had given to Abraham, all that God had promised to Abraham, and so few Jews today believing in Abraham, it is not as though the word of God has failed. The word that Paul specifically has in mind is this word of promise. That God spoke to Abraham in a variety of ways, in that section of Genesis, from Genesis 12 onward. But it's the promise that could be summarized as he did in Genesis 17, 7, with these words, 
And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God repeated this promise in a variety of ways to Abraham and his progeny throughout the Old Testament. And yet, not many Jews in Paul's day were coming to know God by turning from sin and trusting Jesus Christ as Lord. And so, of course, the question comes to mind. Did God's word fail? Has something happened? Paul says, no. Definitely no. And here's how we know that it didn't fail. Paul makes two major points to prove his case, and we're going to look at the first of them this morning, and God willing, come back Look at the second of them next week. The first is found in verses 6 through 9 where he focuses on Abraham and Isaac. And then in verses 10 through 13, he focuses on Jacob and Esau. But let's look at verses 6 through 9 and see that Paul makes the point by highlighting Abraham and Isaac that God's promise was not for all ethnic Israel. What God said to Abraham was not for every person that would be born to Abraham. There are three contrasts that Paul makes in these verses. I want to point them out to you. In the second part of verse 6, he contrasts Israel with Israel. Then in verse 7, he contrasts the children of Abraham with the offspring of Abraham, which is another way of saying children. And then in verse 8, He contrasts the children of the flesh to the children of the promise. Well, let's look at these three contrasts. First, in verse 6, For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all Israel is true Israel. Now, it's obvious that Paul's talking about two Israels here. Or we might say two, he's talking of Israel in two different ways. He's talking about ethnic Israel, those that come from the loins of Abraham, those who descended through bloodlines. And then he's talking about another Israel, what I'm calling true Israel. Not everybody in this first group, the bloodlines group, the ethnic group of Israel, belongs to the second group. Some do, but Paul says, not all, not all. He is speaking about a remnant of, within ethnic Israel that is the true Israel. Now later, he's going to use this very word remnant. We see it if you look down at verse 27 in this chapter, quoting the prophet Isaiah. He says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, which is a word that God used to Abraham, only a remnant of them will be saved. And then he uses the same language in verse 5 of chapter 11, where he writes about a remnant chosen by grace. The remnant is true Israel. They are the people who, in fact, have come to know God because he chose them in Christ. It's not their ethnic descent that put them into that group. It is God's grace. We see this understanding coming out as Paul closes out his letter to the churches of Galatia. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, this is what he writes. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. He said, being a Jew... Not being a Jew doesn't matter. What matters is being a new creation. And then he says, And as for all who walk by this rule, the rule of boasting only in the crucified Savior, the rule of celebrating not your ethnic heritage, but your new creationship worked by the Holy Spirit. As for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. There, Paul, again, is making this distinction between those who came down ceremonially identified with the Old Covenant people of God 
and those who are indeed the true Israel of God. Well, that's the first contrast. Not all Israel is Israel. And we need to understand this as Paul is explaining it to us to help us recognize what God was doing when he first called Abraham and made promises to him. The second contrast is found in verse 7 and illustrated in verse 9. Not all children of Abraham are his true children. Not all the children of Abraham are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac, your offspring shall be named. Abraham had children that were not included in God's promise to be his God and to be his children's God. After God first made this promise to him in Genesis 12, Abraham took matters into his own hands. He decided that he had to do something if God's promise was going to be fulfilled. Because God said, from you will come blessing to all the nations. From you will come kings. From you will come an everlasting kingdom. And Abraham had no children. So what did he do? Well, he took this slave woman, Hagar, and she conceived his son, Ishmael. Ishmael was not simply Abraham's son. He was his firstborn son. But Ishmael was not included in the word of promise that God spoke to Abraham. Instead, when God came to Abraham, some 13 or 14 years later, he assured him that it would be through Isaac that his promise would be fulfilled. His true children would come through Isaac, not through Ishmael. He would come through the son that God promised to give to Abraham, as verse 9 says. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. That's a quote of Genesis 18, verses 10 and 14, where God repeats this promise. And it is something that he said to Abraham after Ishmael had already been born. Now, Paul made this point earlier in chapter 4. He just doesn't elaborate it the way he does here in chapters 9, 10, and 11. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, he uses Abraham and David in order to illustrate God's faithfulness to his promise. And then he concludes that section in verse 18 with these words. This is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his, that is Abraham's, offspring not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. How do we have Abraham as our father? We believe the way Abraham believed. We trust the provision that God has given to us for salvation in Jesus Christ. So we know that God's promise was not for all Israel because not all Israel is true Israel. We know that not all the physical children of Abraham are his true children, Paul says. And the third contrast, the third line of argumentation that Paul uses to show that God's promise is not for all Israel is seen in verse 8. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. What makes a person a child of God truly is God's promise, not natural descent. When God chose Abraham, made a covenant with him, made promises to him and his offspring, he never had in mind that every Israelite would be his child. God's saving purpose was never about making all of physical Israel his people. That is not the way you become a child of God. His saving purpose was never that inclusive so that merely being born into a Jewish family meant that you were automatically a child of God. But neither was his promise ever that exclusive so that being born a non-Jew or a Gentile automatically excludes you, excludes you from any possibility of being a child of God. It's not a matter of the flesh. It's a matter of God's promise. His promise that he sovereignly undertakes to fulfill. So brothers and sisters, 
The salvation that God secures for his people was revealed in the Old Testament era by his choice of Abraham, making promises to Abraham to have him and his children be his people forever. But the children that God had in mind were not all of those who would be born to the physical lineage of Abraham, but rather all of those whom God himself would by grace bring into a right relationship with himself. God made the promise to Abraham and to his seed. And that promise is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Listen to the way Paul explains this in Galatians 3.16. Excuse me. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, and then Paul tells us, reveals who it is, who is Christ. To your offspring, who is Christ. You see his point? When God made this promise to Abraham in the Old Testament, He was promising Jesus Christ. All of the blessings, all the specific promises were always intended to be fulfilled in Christ. I like the way that that John Piper has summarized this very important point if we're going to understand rightly the relationship of the Old Testament to the New, the relationship of the promises and the covenants that are given in the Old Testament to the New Covenant in Christ. Listen to Piper's words. The way God brings into being the true Israel is finally by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, as the true seed of Abraham, the true son of David, and in a profound sense, the true Israel Himself. Jesus fulfilled all that Israel was destined for. And now every person, Jew or Gentile, who trusts in Christ is united to Him and becomes part of this true Israel in Christ. Now, there or some of you here this morning, and you're not trusting Christ. And I I hope you see, this is good news. It's good news for people like you and me, because what this means is that you can get in on these saving blessings of God. There's salvation for you in Christ. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter how religious you've been or irreligious you've been. What matters is your relationship to Christ. And if you'll turn from Christ, turn from sin and trust Christ today, God will accept you. You'll become a part of His salvation. You will come to experience what it means to have God as your Father. To be a true child of God. It's all because of Christ. God, together with all the promises that He has made to His true children, can be yours today. How? By confessing your sin, trusting Jesus Christ as Lord. That has always been God's plan. That has always been His provision. And it's a provision that is available to you. So if you've never trusted Christ before, trust Him now. Take God at His word and believe Him. And bow to King Jesus and come to know forgiveness of sins. Come to know God as your father. Brothers and sisters, you see what this means? It's what it means for us. It means the word of God does not ever fail. It didn't fail the Israelites. God's word never fails. He always keeps his promises. Why? Because he's faithful. What he says he will do. How can we be sure? Because he is the one who sovereignly rules and overrules in every detail of life in order to make sure that what he promises will come to pass. He sees the end from the beginning and everything that he purposes to happen, he works to make sure that it does happen. When he made this promise to Abraham, Sarah was 90 years old and barren. Abraham is a hundred years old. But God wasn't dependent upon Abraham to take matters into his own hands and to father a child by Hagar. God was going to work miraculously in causing Sarah to conceive a child within her womb. 
And Isaac is the child of promise given by God to fulfill that promise that he had made to Abraham. So how should we respond to this message, to this part of God's word? We should respond with renewed determination to take God at his word. To understand what he's saying, make sure we're clear to the best of our ability, and then to bank on everything that's revealed in Scripture to us. His word never fails. He is faithful to the end. What he has said he will do, and we can trust him, regardless of what might come against us. We can be sure of this, that the God who made the promise will use providence in order to see that promise fulfilled. So be encouraged. Be full of hope today. Remember and know that you have a God in heaven who loves you. Who has chosen you. Who has given his son for you. Who has made incredible promises to you. And he will not let those promises fail. So let's go and live by faith in this great God. Pray with me. Our father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ways that you speak to us in Scripture, for these incredible promises that sometimes we just lightly glance at and skate over and don't meditate on, don't let sink into the way that we think about our lives. I pray that you would help us and strengthen us to be people of faith, that we would move forward into the responsibilities you've given us by faith, that you would teach us what it means and empower us to simply take you at your word. So hear our prayers today, O oh God. Seal your truth to our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.